Now that the problem of tunnel boring was practically solved, it was established that the current steam trains were unsuitable for the new tunnels. Luckily, a German inventor called Werner von Siemens and an inventor called Magnus Volk had begun to experiment with a new type of power. These trains were designed to run on electrical energy. While rechargeable batteries had been invented 20 years earlier, the batteries were large and not very powerful, so the railways had to implement a way to give the engine continuous power. Thankfully, the Volks Railway and the German Railway had the answer, with the use of a third rail. The conductive third rail would run under the engine and give continuous power to the engine without the need for batteries. In 1884, the government gave the go-ahead for a new railway called the City of London and Southwark Subway. Because the lines were going to be electrified, there was no need for the tunnels to be as big as the districts or the metropolitans. The two tunnels were just 10 feet in diameter, barely enough room for the train, and they were created 60 feet below ground. James Henry Greathead, who was in charge of the excavation, provided early designs for the tunnel children and perfected it. So much so, the design was most optimal for all subsequent tunnelling within the city. James had envisioned that the railway be powered by a set of moving cables that the engines could grip and ungrip if they wanted to stop. However, this plan simply wasn't feasible, especially when the contractor that was putting in the, the cabling system went bankrupt. In 1890, the City of London boasted two world firsts. The first railway to use electric traction to be used underground, and the first underground railway that was built not using the cut and cover method. The long circular tubes could be built at depths far below the city's tangle of gas and electricity mains and sewers. The City and Southern Railway further added to their world first by adding an elevator to its underground stations and a proper signalling system. In all, 52 locomotives were ordered for the new line from works all around the country. The engines were short and stubby and perfectly suited to the new lines, with the two axles were each driven by a 50 brake horsepower motor which took power from the third rail. The carriages the engines were pulled were wooden, claustrophobic and many passengers referred to them as padded cells rather than coaches. The carriages were not fitted with doors at first, but latticed gates, with a gateman to operate them and calling the station name to the travelling passengers. The gatemen were eventually replaced with enamel plate station indicators that showed the approaching station's name at the end of the carriage. Now the engines and the propulsion was established and proven to work, the new gateshead shielding method of cutting was adopted for all future lines. The promoters were still wary. They didn't want to risk disturbing vital building foundations lest they cause damage, so lines followed the tried and tested method of following the roads. This caused many lines to piggyback one another, which was rather unsettling for the passengers. The ride was bumpy and rough with little to no light and the smell of all those cramped passengers in the hot, cramped conditions, with a lack of regard for the more personal hygiene, would have been less than pleasant. The electric railway was unveiled in grand splendour by the Prince of Wales, Prince Edward, on November 4th, 1890. The City and South London Railway ran their railways very differently to the district and the metropolitan, charging a simple flat fare of 2d, or 2 shillings. There was no paper tickets, with fares being taken at the turnstiles before the passengers alighted. Despite the impressive numbers of passengers it attracted, the railway simply wasn't in making enough of a profit, and even though it was innovative, the other railway companies were not keen to incorporate such a business plan. Over the next two years, five more railways would be authorised by Parliament, for, although only one would be completed. The government set out particular rules and specifications on the minimum diameter of the tunnels and granted powers for the railways to no longer compulsory purchase the buildings above the lines, citing that only permission or a way leave that the railway should cross the land be sufficient, while any lines that will be built under roads will be granted this permission free of charge. 
One of the pivotal lines on the network was the creation of the Central Line. It was a true pioneer and one of the largest official tube lines and would cost almost five times the cost of the City, London and Southwark tube. It was the first tube line to really threaten the metropolitan and district's profits. The threat was well noted, with both railways making steps to ditch the expensive and labour intensive steam power running on their lines. The main financial backer of the line did not come from London or the government, but from American investment. American companies and wealthy aristocrats would heavily invest in the new system and help the railway's design and features. Construction began in 1896 with Sir John Fowler, James Henry Greathead and Sir Gen Benjamin Baker overseeing the new lines. Sadly for James and Sir John, this would be the last project that they would work on. Because of the Whaley powers that were granted, they could go under buildings without disturbing them, but the diggers were still wary and would only go under buildings where it was impractical to follow the roads. Thirteen stations were placed along the route with hydraulic lifts to the surface. On the surface, on ground level, the buildings were tastefully decorated to the area with a terracotta coloured interior. The central line opened on the 27th of June 1900 by then the Prince of Wales, who was also one of the line's financial backers. Other backers were present including American novelist Mark Twain. Unlike the other lines which opened to the public straight away, the line remained closed until late July. When the gates were opened to the public, it was a roaring success. Unlike the other lines however, the line remained very profitable, charging a flat rate along the route, giving the new tube the affectionate nickname of the Two Penny Tube. The real reason for the Central Line's continued success was that it catered for all, not just the working commuters. It ran through many of the shopping districts and the theatre's heart, so because it could count on the extra passengers, the line catered for over 15 million people by the end of the year and over 41 million people throughout 1901, numbers the other railways could only dream of. Because of the Central Line's good fortune, it was able to give good returns to its investors. The investors in turn would develop the lines, in particular put in a much needed ventilation system as many passengers complained about the rank odour and the horrible smell. For the first time in the underground's history, the trains that ran on the Central Line were not made by British hands, but were imported from America. The lines were built by the General Electric Company, the same company that were producing electric trains for the New York Central Lines, and worked in collaboration with track designer and electrical installers British Thomson Houston. The engine sadly didn't last long. It was very noisy, and the huge weight caused the vibration problems within the tube so a secondary solution was desperately called for. So now we welcome to the stage Frank Spray and his multiple unit technology. But Frank's contribution will be told in the next episode. <laughs>